What if we cancelled ContraPoints? Has anybody done that before? Today, we're watching a video about voting. And I know a lot of you are probably sick to death over voting discourse, especially now that the US election is over anyway, but fret not, it's not actually about that. Last October, right before the election, our dearest ContraPoints uploaded a video urging her viewers to set aside their radical inclinations and get out to vote for Joe Biden and stop Trump. And more clearly it worked, so thanks Contra. The video was framed as an argument against the unintentionally iconic Tabby, the archetypal Twitter leftist. Death to capitalize out. While she's of course meant to be an anarchist, she represents any highly online leftist ideology, from anarchist to Marxist-Leninist, and everything else in between. Counter-revolutionary Trotskyite tendency. Throughout the video, ContraPoints is essentially trying to convince Tabby to relinquish her idealism and just go and vote to get Trump out. And on its own, this isn't the worst thing in the world. But this video did end up coming off much harsher against radicalism as a whole than I felt it really had to. We're not about to go through point by point and explain why ContraPoints is a liberal and her leftist parody is actually a hero of the proletariat though, because we don't really see in ContraPoints a specific position for us to critique like that. Even Tabby being some straw man, straw cat girl, aside. This isn't like, say, Vosch, where we might agree on an end goal, but have different ideas about how to get there. While Vosch and his fans might neglect radicalism, this is only out of a belief of it not being immediately relevant. They still generally agree that the conditions under which it might become relevant will come about, and will then deserve our focus. ContraPoints, however, is in a weird middle ground where she presumably thinks socialism is vaguely a good idea, but is deeply disillusioned with the idea of overcoming capitalism and that of revolution ever being realistic. Considering the far right the only ones equipped to seize power in the US should conditions continue to deteriorate. It's from this even further position of political nihilism that the American left is presumably reduced to fighting for concessions from the liberal establishment while propping it up against threats from fascism. The closest thing we can ascribe to ContraPoints is a tepid social democracy, but not even one that's worth deconstructing the consequences of. Because what underpins the message ContraPoints puts out in this video isn't some well-intentioned but ill-thought-out vision of the future. For ContraPoints, the future has been cancelled. All we can do then is address the hopelessness that justifies these concession-based positions in the first place. Before we dive into that though, there were still just a couple nitpicking problems I couldn't help but get off my chest. So strap in, because we're gonna get all the cancelling out of the way over the next couple minutes. Firstly, it does feel a little jarring watching someone who actually probably is quite sympathetic to leftists give them less charitability than most of the conservatives and transphobes that have been dealt with on the same channel. Of course, maybe we can say that for all of the failings of somebody like Jordan Peterson, he's still a professor with written works and ideas that merit a thorough critique while these leftists are just a bunch of stubborn teenagers. But it was Contra's choice to frame things like this. It's not like there aren't academic works from the left for her to engage with. There's a reason it's better to make a video about Jordan Peterson than his Reddit fanboys. But here, rather than steel manning a position, the weakest representation was chosen instead. And while it's true that this video was about voting and not an analysis of leftist ideology, a takedown of leftists was unfortunately what it became anyway. As a result, regardless of how the video was intended, I'm almost certain that, especially with the type of audience ContraPoints has, there are now people who have been turned away from leftism who would have otherwise been interested, or even former leftists who have now been de-radicalized because they're convinced leftism is a joke, full of annoying, delusional teenagers who are more interested in looking cool than actually helping anyone. We get this all the time from conservatives. But coming from someone who is still largely considered a leftist, this does real harm if we ever want to get people interested in anything more than Bernie Sanders. The second problem is how ContraPoints tries to sell us on the 2020 Democratic Party platform by showing a list of their adopted policies. But the 2020 protests have shifted the discourse about policing and criminal justice, and Biden has responded by beginning to shift his position. This year's Democratic platform includes things like stricter use of force standards, banning chokeholds, restricting qualified immunity, creating a registry of police misconduct, limiting no-knock warrants, decriminalizing weed, investing in crime prevention and social work. And is that good enough? No, it's not good enough. But it's a start. It's progress. It shows that the Democrats are at least willing to listen to protests. Of course, today, we know that basically none of these policies have been implemented, and it's increasingly unlikely they ever will be. This might seem like a cheap shot, 
But whether or not Contra was really so naive as to believe Biden would actually do any of these things, or just knew in the back of her mind he wouldn't, but wanted to convince people to vote for him in spite of that to get Trump out, it still spreads the harmful and all too common habit in left liberal spaces of trusting literally anything politicians say while trying to get elected. The third problem is that she messed up the camera ISO for like half the video. Come on Natalie, this is meant to be your job! But as frustrating as these things might be, the views expressed in Contra's video really only tie into a larger perspective that's already present in left liberal communities. Uh, the inclination to view the pursuit of fundamental change as childish or ludicrous, uh, the undue trust placed in the DNC, or the over-reliance on minor and in incremental concessions to affect real change at all. It's this proliferation of cynicism for change that we really want to address. So let's get started. Section 1. How would capitalism even end? <sighs> Tabitha, capitalism is an epical world economic order. When you say end capitalism, you're talking about a tectonic shift in global politics that is so much bigger than all of us that I don't really understand what course of action you're recommending. Like before capitalism, there was feudalism and feudalism ended over hundreds of years of complex shifts in population and production, not because people just decided it was time to end feudalism. So won't capitalism end just whenever a new economic system overtakes it? The weirdest part of this segment for me has to be the phrase, won't capitalism just end when something new overtakes it? I mean, yes? No? It's such a vague statement it can literally mean anything. I've had Sargon of a cat say this to me. It can only function as a stand-in for telling us to stop worrying about capitalism now and just defer its abolition to when society is arbitrarily decided to be ready. ContraPoint does preface this with the quite fair point that capitalism exists in such magnitude that it can be difficult to understand what course of action is even being recommended. So let's begin by explaining what course of action we're recommending. What we really want to understand when asking the question, how would capitalism end, is how societies change from one form to another in the first place. And luckily for Marxism, this is something of a specialty. ContraPoints gives us the example of how feudalism transitioned into capitalism, and this is the perfect place to start. Broadly, we think of these two things simply as two different economic systems. But obviously, that abstraction can be quite vague. There are lots of different things that go into making a global economic order. Marxists try to highlight the features in an economic system that are the most fundamental, the underlying characteristics upon which everything else we associate with them develops. For Marxism, this is called the mode of production i.e. the way in which society produces goods. Feudalism and capitalism are, on a fundamental level, defined through this feature. In feudalism, each serf, peasant, craftsman, etc. would, generally speaking, own their own tools and land as private property. These were then used to produce goods for which there was a direct need, and were then used or consumed by either the people who had made them, or by a ruling class like the aristocracy. This is in stark contrast to capitalism, where now all of these tools and land previously owned by individual peasants are collectivized into the hands of capitalist producers, and goods are produced only because they can be exchanged for a profit. In short then, feudalism is a mode of production in which goods are produced because they are useful, and capitalism is one in which goods are produced because they are exchangeable. This distinction is helpful because it gives us a lens through which we can analyse how these different economic systems shift and evolve into new ones. Critically, how elements already existing in the old mode of production necessitate the advancement to the new one. For instance, the bourgeoisie existed as a middle class in feudalism for some time, but it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that they really rose to prominence by outmoding the existing production process in the serf-lord relation with early factories producing goods much faster and as a result selling them much cheaper than independent producers could ever hope to. This transformation didn't just play out like some natural process though. The aristocracy predictably clung onto power for as long as they could, fighting back against the progress the bourgeoisie were trying to introduce at every step of the way, until these tensions culminated in eruptions of class war like in the French Revolution. Essentially, one economic system shifts to another because of problems that always existed in the first, but were in a sense waiting for the proper technological advancements and heightened social tensions to be in place before they could rise to the surface and shake the existing economic order to its core. 
What's more is, these problems exist in such a way that resolving them can only ever lead to one specific new form of production. The tensions that caused feudalism to give way to capitalism couldn't have been resolved by going back to antiquity and slave society, nor could they have resulted in some sustainable hybrid of capitalism and feudalism. The way feudalism worked meant that even from the very start, it was always going to eventually dissolve into the capitalist mode of production. This is very different from the course of change that ContraPoints offers us. The transition from feudalism to capitalism is painted as a spectrum of amorphous incremental changes that eventually augmented feudalism into modern capitalism. This buries the lead on the underlying currents of change that were at work. The bitter class tensions between the aristocracy and the emerging bourgeoisie emboldened by industrial technology. All we can infer from won't capitalism end whenever a new economic system overtakes it is that societies evolve into new ones by adapting to new technology and ideas over time. And when you de-emphasize the social relations mediating this process, this becomes only a step above how Redditors imagine Elon Musk might solve our problems. It can only leave us to rely on the good nature of people and institutions who very much do not have our best interests at heart. Because while we might ignore our position in class struggle, Elon Musk definitely won't. Now while we're obviously dealing in quite broad strokes here, we're not here to rigorously prove this analysis of history, just present it as an analysis in the first place, which is already a step above what ContraPoints is offering. And with this analysis, we can begin to explore how capitalism might become socialism. We've established that economic systems like feudalism and capitalism have innate problems and contradictions built into them that periodically rise to the surface and provoke change. And in capitalism, this typically takes the form of economic crashes, a necessary staple for any market economy, causing us to experience some form of economic crash usually every 10 years or so. Sometimes these bust periods are so severe, however, that society is pushed into disarray, leading to large portions of the population struggling for food and housing. It's made all the more frustrating under capitalism specifically, as this is rarely due to an issue of scarcity like it might have been before. Instead, we have to look on as countless empty homes and inordinate amounts of food and goods are being deliberately destroyed to maintain market prices. When we reach these periods, radical currents from both the left and right swirl in popularity as people search for an answer to these pressing problems. And if the existing liberal establishment can't maintain order against these political tides, which as we'll see later is often a question of their own internal consistency and the power of these opposing forces, then the possibility of revolution to either side opens up. This is why the size and scale of capitalism that ContraPoints alludes to isn't really all that important. The system doesn't face any kind of external force that challenges it head on, but rather itself creates the conditions which threaten it. This is, essentially, the course of action we recommend. To seize the inevitable crises brought about by a system tied up in its own contradictions. That all being said, don't worry. I am aware of how a lot of this stuff can come off. What we've set up here is just the ideal baseline for what a revolution could look like, without any of the caveats that ContraPoints is about to bring up. Section 2. Aren't there, like, no communists? I don't think that's the kind of thing that can be accomplished by a small group of activists. And I say small group because, I'm sorry to break it to you, but the vast majority of Americans are not communists. I think a lot of internet leftists have a vastly overinflated sense of how big and important they are. Talking to voters teaches you the hard realities of what your fellow Americans actually care about. And when I was canvassing, I did talk to some left-wing people, you know, I, I talked to union families, but I don't think I talked to a single communist. It is true that communists are an insignificant minority in Western populations. Some go as far to say there are only around 30,000 real communists. But in reality, the idea of a communist or socialist isn't as well defined as you may think. We're generally conditioned to see politics through a very electoral lens, as obviously elections are the main medium through which conventional politics exists. This lens gives us a very strict understanding of political labels and identities, and our conception of the overtone window. How far right or left you're able to get away with being in conventional politics, usually defined through the fringes of major political parties. When the overtone window moves one way, the other side has to move with it to maintain political relevance. And if we want to push the overtone window to a certain spot, we need to cover all the ground between our goal and where we already are first, in incremental steps. We can see this in conscious perspective on the problem too. 
Throughout the video, revolution is posed as an alternative plan to voting, and Contra's response to this is that there just aren't enough communists for that to happen. If we want to build support for socialism, we have to outreach to the normies more i.e. push the overtone window until socialism is acceptable. But look, if what you want is socialism, or even just social democracy, then you have a lot of work ahead of you in terms of outreach. You have to engage people, educate, raise awareness. But you don't want to do that, because it requires that you stop owning the libs and start actually communicating with them. And from this perspective, we can generally agree it's a pretty hopeless goal to aim for socialism as things currently stand. But, lucky for us, the path to socialism, as it were, isn't quite so linear. Populist movements, generally speaking, aren't established by incremental steps, but rather through existing currents being tapped into that allow for sudden bursts of energy and support. Bernie Sanders did not create the wave of social democracy in America himself, but rather rose to relevance atop what had naturally formed after the 2008 crisis. While the overtone window informs where conventional politics currently lie, the bounds by which politics is kept, it's the conditions of society itself that informs what kind of mass movements are able to take form independently from the overtone window altogether. Trump was outside the overtone window before he ran, but the nerve he hit on to rise to success was always there. It was the American political system that had to catch up to the wider consciousness of the country as it actually existed, and we call this process shifting the overtone window. Socialism operates in much the same way. It's a populist movement that swells in support very suddenly and irrespective of where the overtone window might currently lie. Instead of having to incrementally bring ourselves to the point where socialism is acceptable, it crashes into relevancy without warning. This is often why, especially older people, can often talk about modern times not making any sense, or everybody losing their minds in the face of populist movements, left and right wing. They defy the established rules of politics that many of us are used to. But socialism is even more unique here, in that it's not only a populist movement, but also a radical one, that aims to undo society at its very foundations. This means that, regardless of where the overtone window lies, left or right, there are only definite political moments under which its ideas can become realistic. Moments under which the preconceptions of what's possible are done away with. We have an example of this on a smaller scale in the US with the George Floyd riots. Like I've said before, the people who chased the police out of their own stations, took them over and then burnt them down would have never considered such a thing as realistic only a week before, just a year later and it's once again unthinkable. But during that specific moment that people got together and were so angry that they knew nothing could stop them, the impossible happened anyway. And this is perhaps the most important point. Were these people socialists? Were they even likely to be, by our conventional definitions, politically active? No, there's a very real chance they didn't even vote. But there and then, they were some of the most political people in the whole country, and whether or not they realised it, they were radical. While people like ContraPoints like to imagine the growth of a communist movement happening when enough people change the ideology in their Twitter bios, in reality things are more fluid than this. Like we've seen, the idea of a socialist isn't so strictly defined. We can have people come up in the statistics as just another dem voter one week, and then those same people throwing stones at cop cars the next. It's all about the conditions that people find themselves in. And as we've seen from our analysis before, it's in the nature of capitalism to continually recreate the conditions which threaten it. Even moving from the George Floyd riots and to the later protests, we still saw millions of people take to the streets to challenge ideas fundamental to current society. These, nor even any of the initial uprisings, were socialist. But why is that? Because of concerns about pragmatism and how realistic it is? Because they mean scared off by edgy Twitter MLs or Antifa thugs? Because they're actually all baby boomers and Red Scare propaganda still works on them? No, it's because nobody's even told them that it's an option in the first place. But it's during these times when populist movements form outside of the overtone window, when radical moments throw open the gates to what's possible altogether, that socialism is realistic. That being said, socialism being realistic and then people actually becoming socialists are two different things, and this is where those of us that exist right now have to come in. But the question of how do you convince people, even when the time is right, is beyond the scope of this video. If you are interested in the organisational theory where it's assumed from the start that revolution is something worth pursuing, I would recommend my video response to Vosch. For now though, all we're interested in is establishing how socialism becomes an option to begin with, 
not in the incremental buildup that we see in ContraPoints, but rather the sudden reshifting of all conventions as a result of the self-imposed crises of capitalism. So yes, there aren't many communists right now, but that's not as damning as it appears. Does this mean then that one day, people will be lining up in the thousands to join the Socialist Party, and with the right political messaging, everyone will see the faults of capitalism and demand revolution? Well, if you actually look at history, there have been times when that more or less has happened, but I don't think it's the type of movement we'd be dealing with in our times. Really, I think we're most likely to see just further intensifications of what we already saw with the George Floyd protests. A collective mass of no one specific political label groups together to make a demand the current society simply cannot provide. And as capitalism grows more unworldly and the demands more fundamental, there's no other direction that such a movement can progress than some form of socialism, whether or not they're explicit about it. So far though, there is still one piece of the puzzle missing. Even if the masses want socialism, how do we get socialism? And this brings us on to our next problem that ContraPoints lays out for us, that being... Section 3. How do you overthrow a government? But... revolution. Revolution to end capitalism. Okay, so you're saying that your plan is to do a communist revolution and overthrow the US government. That's very valid. That's super hecking valid. That's extremely valid. I mean, I guess I admire the ambition. Uh, just a couple quick follow-up questions though. Are you counting on the US military and police taking the side of the communists or is your plan to overpower them? Because unless you know something about the military that I don't, I don't think that much of the military is going to defect to join a communist revolution. So uh, there will have to be a war. You know, revolution doesn't happen overnight. After the Russian Revolution, there is the Civil War from 1917 to 1923. So uh, you are going to need to raise a Red Army. I mean, you can't have a communist revolution without a Red Army, right? So how's that going, Tabitha? How many weapons have you amassed? How many units have you trained? <laughs> Why are we talking about this? Why am I even entertaining this notion? You know, when the far right talks about violence and overthrowing the government, they actually mean it. And you know they mean it because they have literal militias, the three percenters, the boogaloo boys. They're stockpiling weapons and training to use them. They have ex-military men in their ranks and connections to white supremacists within the police and the military. Whereas when leftists talk about revolution on Twitter, it strikes me as ideation, not intent. Many people, liberals and leftists included, struggle to envision what revolution actually is. When in an abstract framing, with all you have to fill in the blanks, an idea of some grand showdown in the streets between Twitter leftists and the military, it's easy to buy into the dismissiveness ContraPoints puts forward. And this is why it can be such a common attitude. It is true that if we just approached the US military and asked, hey guys, wanna join our revolution? We probably wouldn't get anywhere, except maybe a CIA black site. Likewise, if we launched a full frontal assault on the army, it would be very short-lived indeed. But is anyone besides Tabby actually suggesting this? Hopefully, by this point, you can agree that revolution is not just an idea we debate over, an alternative plan we can just pick up, but the necessary assertion of social tensions that cannot otherwise resolve themselves, a situation we find ourselves in instead of one we construct. But even accepting that, it still doesn't answer the central question that ContraPoints is really putting forward to us with her discouragements. How do you overthrow a government? The problem is, it's kind of difficult to pin down exactly how a revolution happens, because no two ever play out the same. ContraPoints does bring up the Russian Revolution though, so maybe we can start there. What's actually kind of funny is Contra uses Russia as an example for the inevitability of war and open conflict in achieving revolution, telling us that we can't have a revolution without a Red Army, right? But ignoring that the Red Army didn't actually exist until a year after, the Bolshevik Revolution was actually largely peaceful. Intense civil war followed after the revolution, but this was just a fight to maintain power against the remaining reactionary elements of the military. The actual seizure of power was about conflict, not a single person died. Honestly, I don't know why people like to think of Russia as the archetypal socialist revolution, because in reality it was actually just really weird. But if you are interested in what trends are persistent in all revolutions, looking at outliers like this can be a pretty good way to highlight them. So the Russian revolution started properly at the beginning of 1917 in February rather than in October. Worn out from fighting in World War I, 
a demoralized military defected against the Tsar and forced him to abdicate. But this wasn't a communist revolution, and the Bolsheviks themselves were a small and largely insignificant party at the time. Rather, a liberal democratic provisional government was formed to manage state power in Russia, consisting of many prominent Russian industrialists and ex-officials from the monarchy. There was a lot wrong with this government, but crucially, they continued Russia's involvement in the war against Germany for monetary interests. The failings of this government quickly grew more numerous over time, and the Bolsheviks under Lenin used this to champion their own positions, asserting that only they could pull Russia out of the war to meet people's basic needs steadily increasing their popularity and relevance as a result. After Bolshevik organizational efforts worked to prevent an attempted far-right military coup in June that we're just going to have to gloss over for now, the legitimacy of the provisional government was quickly waning and the popularity of the Bolsheviks at an all-time high, having gone from just 20,000 members in February to 200,000 in September. It's highly likely that if it weren't for the Bolsheviks all but saving the provisional government in June, we would have seen Russia as the world's first fascist state. By October, they had the support they needed to seize power from the provisional government and pull Russia out of the war, and so they began their insurrection. Though by this point, this was just a matter of Bolsheviks mobilizing and occupying key infrastructure like the railways and telecommunications etc, and by the time they converged on the Winter Palace, where the provisional government resided, they had already won, and the provisional government surrendered without a fight. It was several months after this that the civil war Contra referred to was started by the remaining reactionary elements of the army. But by this point, the communists were already in charge of the state. Again, it wasn't a question of seizing power in the first place, but using military strategy to preserve power. But how about another example? If the Russian Revolution didn't involve much, if any, direct conflict during its communist uprising, what about somewhere that did? What does revolution look like there? Well, how about anarchist favourites, revolutionary Catalonia, and the Spanish Civil War? Like Russia, Spain had been a mess for quite a while before the revolution everyone's familiar with. Only two years before the start of the Spanish Civil War, there was another attempted socialist insurrection that started as a minor strike and turned into a head-on assault on the far-right Spanish government of the time, declaring a dictatorship of the proletariat in the territory they managed to occupy. This was followed by a brutal retaliation by the Spanish army, led by a little-known military general by the name of Franco, remember him for later, and resulting in as many as nearly 30,000 people imprisoned and nearly 2,000 people killed. The year of the Civil War started with this same far-right government narrowly losing an election to a social democratic party called the Popular Front. Contesting the results and seeking to return order to Spain, right-wing Spanish military generals started preparing to stage a coup. The social democrats in government had a strong suspicion this was coming, but refused to arm anyone to strengthen Spain against the oncoming coup out of fear that arming workers would then give them power to overthrow the government instead. Rather than risk workers gaining any power, the Social Democrats were offering to negotiate with the fascist military generals and likely even surrender. When the military coup launched though, socialist organizations started raiding armories directly and fought back against the military forces in their cities, with the biggest victories being in Catalonia. It should be pointed out that even at this point, the Social Democratic government still wanted to disarm the workers but with the majority of the military defecting to the far right, the main force they still had to secure power were the police force, who by themselves were powerless against the armed and organized workers. As such, the workers continued to push their advantage after fighting off the coup and seized key infrastructure and means of production across all the cities they managed to hold, with the remaining police force still powerless to stop them. They had essentially by this point formed a dictatorship of the proletariat, and it was they who were in charge instead of the existing government. What followed from here was of course the Spanish Civil War, and while the communists in Russia were able to successfully use their newfound power to resist fascist counter-revolution, those in Spain sadly could not. Examining exactly why the years after the start of the Civil War played out how they did could be its own video. All we're concerned with today is how they organized to take the power they had in the first place. Looking back at the minor strike preceding the Spanish Civil War, we've seen head-on conflict with the military lead to bloody slaughters and brutal repression. A lot of people like to say that if leftists ever tried anything radical in the US, they'd be immediately gunned down without mercy, because the government is so much more willing to be nicer to the right than it is leftists. But this isn't anything special about the US. Revolutionaries have been drowned in blood across countries typically thought of as further left throughout history. It happened in Spain, it happened in Italy in the lead up to Mussolini, and it happened in Germany, where even social democrats literally killed Rosa Luxemburg, and by hiring a paramilitary group that would go on to form the SS at that, 
The place's revolutionaries were successful was certainly not due to any leniency relative to the US. So you may wonder then, does history tell us that initiating open conflict with the military is a hopeless cause? Personally, I don't think it's the best or even most likely course of events, which is why I wanted to show two prominent examples where the communists weren't the ones initiating things at all, but rather working with the crumbling situation they found themselves in. That being said though, there is one well-known example where a group of ragtag revolutionaries managed to fight and win against what would appear to be a hopelessly superior power. No, no, I don't mean that one. I am of course talking about Cuba. A couple years before the revolution, Cuba's government had been taken over by a US-backed military coup led by a man called Batista. To keep things short, he was incredibly corrupt, brutal and unpopular, but firmly in control. There were no divisions in the state here for anybody to take advantage of. But that didn't stop Fidel Castro and other would-be revolutionaries from stockpiling weapons and making calculated attacks that might inspire the oppressed under Batista to rise up against him. After initial failed attempts, Castro fled to Mexico City where he met Che Guevara and rounded up a revolutionary force to storm the shores of Cuba once again with as many as... 80 men. Yeah, I'm not sure what they were thinking there either. When they landed in Cuba, they fled from the mountains while under the continuous attack by the military, leaving only 19 of them alive by the time they had reached any kind of safety. These remaining 19 men continued their efforts against Batista's government, however. From the remote mountains and depths of the jungle, they used pirate radio stations to appeal to the locals of surrounding villages they passed by, bringing in support from a wide variety of people against the corruption of Batista. Not just existing communists, but everyone from students to Catholic priests who felt injustice under the dictatorship. This coincided with periodic hit and run attacks on small military outposts, using guerrilla tactics to outmaneuver the superior arms and greater numbers of the Cuban military. By never engaging in direct open combat, but slipping in and out of terrain to plant ambushes where they could, the rebels were able to hold their position against an army who were becoming more and more demoralized. Batista even resorted to bombing runs of the jungle to try and wipe the rebels out, using napalm courtesy of the US. There was certainly no restraint here on the part of the government, and yet the rebels still held on, and kept dealing blows against the military. As pressure mounted against Batista, and his ability to maintain control questioned, he only became more brutal by censoring the media and ordering extrajudicial torture and killings of citizens, which only fueled the wider sentiment against him. This culminated in parts of the army beginning to surrender to the rebels themselves and directly refusing the orders to commit war crimes that Batista's government gave them. By this point, the war was already over. It still took some time for Castro's new government to solidify, but this was undoubtedly the turning point in the revolution. We've now seen three contrasting examples where revolutionaries were able to overcome state power. But did these revolutionaries make it so much further as just some arbitrary happenstance of history? In the first two examples, in Russia and Spain, what really highlights their success is that, unlike a supposed liberal imagining, the revolutionaries did not engineer their situations so they could stage insurrection, but rather played on existing conditions as they developed to eventually confront a paralyzed ruling class that was powerless to stop them. Neither of them randomly convinced the military to defect or initiated head-on conflict with them because in both cases, the military had very much become a mess on its own accord before these revolutionaries had even done anything. But just to fly in the face of all of that, and speak to how varied and unpredictable these events are, sometimes, like in Cuba, none of that matters at all, and you literally can just fight the military head on and win, if you know what you're doing. Maybe ContraPoint doesn't believe the American left would ever pull this off, and maybe I don't blame her, but lucky for the Americans, it turns out there's more than one way to overthrow a government. There's still one last question though, could this ever happen in the US? The thing with the US, is I can throw out as many examples of revolutions as I like, point to as many trends in recent years, offer many plausible scenarios, there's always going to be the attitude in regards to the US specifically that all of these ideas are still ridiculous. The people are too right wing, the military too well organised or indoctrinated, or western countries generally just too stable or perhaps even too well off in luxuries for their people to ever want to revolt. But if a key ingredient for insurrection is just the instability of the government, this really all boils down to just one question. Will current society stay stable forever? Depending on who you ask, it's not even stable right now. Even if we want to go all the way to the climate collapse, and I personally don't think we have to, everybody should be able to agree that in the long term, society as it currently exists can just not last. 
And I don't blame people for struggling to imagine how cracks might appear in the US military or the downfall of the US empire itself. I struggle too. But that's just a given when thinking about these things. Because trying to speculate on the specifics like this is kind of like trying to have predicted a Trump presidency in the 90s. And of course, insurrections don't rely on the entire military defecting at once, just instability cracking open divisions, causing state institutions to tie up over themselves, all but leaving power open to anybody ready to seize it. And that's the key point here, being ready. ContraPoints tells us that when it comes to this, the right are the only ones who actually mean it. But if it really is the case that the left is just so well prepared and hopeless compared to the right, shouldn't we be rushing to fix that as fast as we can? instead of using it as an excuse to placate the left and tag along to liberalism, just waiting for a more organised right to come along and take power unopposed. After all, if history is anything to go by, the only way to stop a fascist attempt at taking power is with a leftist one. Now I know that was a lot, but what better way to respond to ContraPoints than with an overly long video? We've traced out the whole path of revolution, from a crisis in capitalism causing disruption and instability, which drives the budding of new populist radical movements, which, when able to seize the right political moments, can erupt into relevancy and exploit the open divisions and fractures in ruling class power to take society for themselves. This is obviously quite difficult though, there's a reason we don't have socialism yet, and it's because it's an uphill battle. It relies on an existing leftist movement to be able to seize these opportunities and convince people who might be open to socialism to then actually be socialists. And this is why we need to be preparing such a movement right now instead of wallowing in concessionist nihilism. While I feel like I've laid out these ideas as if they were to say bulletproof, please don't mistake me as some preacher for the inevitable revolution. If you look back at the last 50 years of leftist theory, you'll quickly realise that it's leftists who are the first to bring up that things are far more nuanced than what I've laid out here, and that success is far from guaranteed. But even then, these leftists are all still at the baseline understanding that capitalism has to go, and it has to be through revolutionary means. That's what this video has been about, getting you disaffected Sotdems up to that point to begin with, so we can actually start doing something. Like I mentioned before, if you are interested in dealing with exactly what we can do right now to organise, my response to Vorsch tries to deal with this in more detail. But do remember that it is just a start. For now though, let's just agree that while we all obviously love ContraPoints, it's best not to get stuck into her defeatism painted as being realistic. Leftists, SOC Dems, and hell, even some liberals all at least agree we want some real positive change. And relying on the establishment to hand that down to us with no further plans for the future is probably the worst way to go about it. So I hope with this video, socialism is back on the table for you. Hey guys, uh, so I just want to say, you know, thanks so much for watching the whole video and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this was very much a, a journey to make. It has been from the moment I started writing the script, literally in the making for a year, over a year now, it went through four different editors, technically, and not including myself, <laughs> um, uh, which may explain why the editing style varies at certain points of the video, but I, you know, hope it's all enjoyable nonetheless. Um, I just kind of wanted to give a heads up about things. Um, obviously, as you can probably already tell, I, I have a lot of IRL things on these days. Uh, I'm currently doing a PhD, I'm really enjoying it and having a great time, and I'm actually going outside, you know, touching that grass, uh, it, it's really crazy. Um, but it does mean that I definitely can't keep up with a consistent upload schedule. Um, so, you know, I, I'm at the point now where I'm not even trying anymore, you know, because I know it's just not worth, really worth it. That being said though, I am always going to be making these videos just as a personal project to myself, if nothing else, right? Um, I love making these and I can't imagine stopping because I'm always going to have more things to say. Um, as, uh, on that note, actually, uh, if you do want to actually see those videos, and you're here right now already, uh, make sure that you turn on notifications for this channel because otherwise the algorithm just isn't going to show you my, video, my videos the one year that I upload them. Um, and leading on from that, 
yeah, I'm not really trying to appease the algorithm these days anymore, and I'm not chasing the views or whatever, but that doesn't mean that I, you know, I still don't want uh, as many people as possible getting the opportunity to see these videos because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> I think they're pretty good. I think they've got some worthwhile stuff to say. I think they can be good for teaching people or convincing people. And, you know, this one especially, I'm so happy with how it came out. Um, and it, it may be, in my opinion, it's one of my favorite videos, I think, that I've ever made. <laughs> um, so to that effect, I would just like to ask, you know, if, if we're not having the algorithm show anybody this video, then really the only outlet we have to to get it to people is you guys, right? Uh, word of mouth. Um, so, you know, share it with your friends, uh, link it to your favorite streamers who are like looking for content to react to, uh, share it on whatever discords you hang out on or whatever, just wherever you think somebody might find it, you know, worthwhile to give a watch, just, just send it their way and um, that's that's all I can ask, you know, if you're so inclined. Um, that being said, though, of course, I still greatly appreciate everybody who is already here right now, and I love you all too. Um, and of course, I'll see you in the next video, whenever that is. I don't know when, but the point is, is that it is coming at some point. So, yeah, thanks again for watching, and uh, have a good one.